Hello students, myself Dr. Dhan Lakshmi, Assistant Professor from the Department of Prosthodontics, Vinayaga Mission Sankracharya Dental College, Salem. Today, I'll be speaking about direct retainers in removable partial denture. To introduce, retention is a quality which is inherent in dental prosthesis which prevents the dislodgement of prosthesis away from the supporting tissue and this retention is provided by direct retainer which we are going to see today. So to define, direct retainer is any component of a removable partial denture which is used to retain and prevent dislodgement consisting of a clasp assembly or a precision attachment. So basically this direct retainer is going to provide retention and it can be either a clasp assembly or an attachment. So coming to the classification of direct retainers, it can be either an intracoronal direct retainer or an extracoronal direct retainer. So as the name indicates, intracoronal direct retainer resides within the contours of the abutment teeth and this this can be either a precision attachment or a semi-precision attachment. And now coming to extra coronal direct retainers, this extra coronal direct retainers resides outside the contours of the abutment teeth and it can be a clasp assembly or an attachment. So now coming to an intra coronal direct retainer, as I already told, these direct retainers resides within the normal contour of an abutment teeth. So now what is an attachment? Intra coronal direct retainer mostly is an attachment. So now what is an attachment? It is basically a two component system. So it has two component. One component attached to the tooth and the other component attached to the prosthesis. So now during insertion and removal these two components come in contact with each other and this will provide retention. So a matrix and a patrix will be there. Matrix is otherwise called as a female component and patrix otherwise called as male component. So this female component or matrix in intra coronal direct retainers is placed within the contours of the clinical crown. So a metal receptacle which is placed in the contour, within the contours of the clinical crown is called as a matrix and a patrix or a male component will be attached to the RPD here. So during insertion these two components will come in contact providing retention. So based on the methods of fabrication these attachments can be either a precision attachment or a semi-precision attachment. So now what is the difference between precision and semi-precision attachment? Attachment. Precision attachment, as the name suggests, this precision is exceptional in precision attachment because of long parallel walls of the patrix component. So the patrix what we see here in precision attachment will have a long parallel wall. Whereas in semi-precision attachment, the patrix will have a gentle tapering walls. So what is the use of this gentle tapering walls in semi-precision attachment? So when we have a gentle tapering walls, the intimate contact between the matrix and patrix won't be there. There is going to be some amount of leeway or the gap between a matrix and a patrix component because of which there is going to be movement of the prosthesis and dissipation of force. All the forces won't be transferred completely to the tooth. Whereas in precision attachment, since we have a long parallel walls, there is going to be intimate contact between the matrix and patrix because of which all the forces is going to be transferred to the tooth. So in cases where distal extension cases or teeth with compromised periodontium, where we don't want to concentrate all the force on the teeth, we will be going for semi-precision attachment. But most of the intracoronal attachments are precision attachments and all prefabricated attachments or precision attachment whereas the lab made or custom made attachments or semi precision attachments. Now what is the advantage of having an attachment? There is going to be elimination of visible rest and support component and since these attachments or transferring forces nearly close to the long axis of the tooth, there is going to be better vertical support, horizontal stabilization and also since these components allow little bit movement of the prosthesis, there is going to be intermittent vertical massage to the underlying gums. So disadvantage, since we are going to place the entire attachment within the contours of the tooth, we need to prepare to receive the metal receptacle. So while preparing, we need to mostly devitalize the tooth. And also due to frictional resistance, matrix and patrix starts to wear in due course. So once it has worn out, difficult it is difficult to repair and replace. And it is clinical and lab procedure is complicated and it is difficult to place completely within the contours of 
the tooth in the anterior teeth especially and it is expensive so coming to extra coronal direct retainers so till now we saw about the intra coronal direct retainers what is an attachment what is precision attachment what is semi precision attachment its advantage and disadvantage so now we'll be seeing about extra coronal direct retainer so as the name suggests these retainers are going to completely lie outside the contours of the tooth so it is divided into a clasp assembly or an attachment so now coming to extra coronal attachments so as i already told these attachments or two component system a matrix and a patrix will be there which when during insertion of the processes will help in the retention but here in extra coronal attachments it's going to be vice versa then intra coronal att attachments we kept a matrix in then the normal contour of the tooth and the patrix was attached to the rpd here it is going to be vice versa a patrix or a male component will be attached outside the clinical contours of the tooth whereas a matrix or a female component which is going to be attached to the rpd so this is the only difference between extra coronal and intra coronal attachments and extra coronal attachments mostly it is a semi precision attachment because during distal extension in distal extension cases we need to dissipate the force to dissipate that force we need to have a semi precision attachment next coming to the clasp assembly so before going into detail about different types of clasp let us see about the history of the clasp assembly J H Prothero in the year 1960 proposed a cone theory according to that the contours of the clinical crown everything resembles two cones having a common base so now let us see about the clasp assembly so before going into detail about the different types of clasp let us see about the history so j h prothero in the year 1960 proposed a cone theory so according to this cone theory the contours of clinical crown resembles two cones sharing a common base so this is the common base upper one cone is there lower one cone is there so this common base is the area of greatest circumference and this area is called as high of contour which was coined by dr edward kennedy in the year 1928 anything above that contour height of contour is called a supra bulge area and anything below that is called as an infra bulge area so now why we need to know about this cone theory because the infra bulge area which is saw now is going to help in retention so this infra bulge area will be occupied by the clasp assembly so when the clasp assembly engage this infra bulge area that is going to provide retention so when we are seeing about the clasp assembly we should keep this in mind that is the infra bulge area is going to help in retention which will be engaged by the clasp assembly so now coming to the structure of clasp assembly it has four components a retent to arm rest reciprocal arm and a minor connector so now let us see each one in detail rest so basically this is the rest and the function of the rest is to provide a vertical support so what is a vertical support so it is the resistance towards the tissue ward movement so the resistance towards tissue ward movement is provided by the rest that is the most important function of any rest in a removable partial denture and it has to be rigidly joined to rpd framework to resist the fracture coming to the other functions since it is preventing the tissue ward movement of the prosthesis it is going to maintain the return to arm in its position thereby enhancing the retention and also it transmits the functional forces parallel to the long axis of the abutment so these are the other functions of rest so rest basically it is of three types occlusal rest cingulum rest and incisal rest occlusal rest is placed over premolars and molars cingulum rest mostly preferred over maxillary canines and incisal rest over incisors and mandibular canines so now now coming to the next component which is the retent to arm so this retent to arm is going to provide retention based on the approach of engaging the undercut this retent to arm it can be the clasp assembly can be a supra bulge or an infra bulge clasp assembly so supra bulge retent to arm so these retent to arm will engage the undercut from the occlusal direction whereas an infra bulge clasp arm is going to engage the undercut from the apical or a gingival direction so this is the difference between a supra bulge clasp arm and an infra bulge clasp arm so now coming to the parts of a retent to arm so for a supra bulge clasp arm 
which is engaging the undercut from the occlusal direction, there are three parts, proximal third, middle third and a distal third. So this proximal third is otherwise called as a body, it has to be rigidly placed above the height of the contour. Middle third is limited flexible and it is placed above the height of contour and distal third is flexible and placed below the height of contour. So now we can make out that this proximal distal, distal third of the retentive arm is going to provide retention because this is the only portion of the clasp assembly which is going to engage the undercut. So there are three parts of a retentive arm, proximal third, middle third and distal third. Both proximal and the middle third is going to lie above the height of contour. Only the last portion that is the distal third is going to be below the height of contour or an infra bulge area. So when it is engaging the infra bulge area only that is going to provide retention. So why we need to make it flexible? The other components are rigid. Why we need this retentive tunnel to be flexible? Because it has to cross the height of the contour and then it has to engage the undercut. So only when it is flexible it can cross the height of contour and engage the undercut without damaging the tooth. So as I told coming to the mechanism of action during insertion this retentive arm is going to pass over the height of the contour and the terminal will engage the undercut area. On removal again it will pass the height of the contour and then it will help in removal of the prosthesis and on complete seating it has to be passive only when it is passing the height of contour it has to be active after passing the height of contour and engaging the undercut it has to be passive. So now coming to infra bulge clasp arm. So this infra bulge clasp arm has an approach arm which arises from the rigid framework and this approach arm crosses the mucosa in horizontal direction and then crosses the free gingival margin at 90 degree. After that there is a portion called as terminus and this terminus arises from the vertical projection of the approach arm and this approach arm is a minor connector. So only minor connector which is flexible is this approach arm. Why we need it to be flexible? Only when it is flexible it is easy to insert and remove since it is engaging the undercut from the apical direction. So only minor connector to be flexible is the approach arm. So this is the characteristics of the infra bulge class assembly. So now coming to the third component which is called as reciprocal arm. So now we saw about the retentive arm. So retentive arm as I told it is going to the retentive terminus of the retentive arm is going to pass over the height of contour and then engage the undercut area. So during insertion and removal it is going to pass. So when it is passing it is going to give some amount of lateral forces to that particular tooth and because of that there is going to be damage to the periodontium. So how to avoid this? There is something to counteract these forces and that component is called as reciprocal arm. So here it is a retentive arm. So when there is no reciprocal arm, when the retentive arm is placed, when the retentive arm is passing the height of the contour, there is going to be forces towards the tooth and because of that there is going to be damage in the periodontium. So now if we have a reciprocal arm on the lingual aspect then what is going to happen the forces will be counteracted by this reciprocal arm. So the main function of this reciprocal arm is to provide stability and it is very important in a clasp assembly and this reciprocal arm should be fabricated in such a way that it remains in place when the retentive arm is crossing the height of contour. So during insertion before the retentive arm passes the height of contour this reciprocal arm should be in contact and during during removal, when the retentive arm is passing over the height of contour, this reciprocal arm should be in contact. So before, in, during insertion and removal, the reciprocal arm should be in contact with the tooth and it is rigid and it is placed above the height of contour. Only the retentive terminus is placed in the undercut area that is below height of the contour, remaining the reciprocal arm, the rest, even the middle and the proximal third of the retentive arm is placed above the height of the contour. So next coming to the final component which is the minor connector and this minor connector joins the body to the remainder of the framework and it has to be rigid and again it also helps in stability and it also act as a guide plane for insertion and removal. So now coming to the requirements of clasp assembly, there are basically six requirements, retention, support, 
promotes stability, reciprocation, encirclement and passivity. Let us see in detail. So now retention, as I already told, retention is a quality which is inherent in the processes which prevents the dislodgement of the processes away from the tissue. There is no single component which is going to solely responsible for retention. There are multiple components which works together to help in retention such as the retentive arm. As I already told, the distal most end of the retentive arm is called as retentive terminus and that is going to engage the undercut and helping in retention. And intimate relationship of minor connectors with the guide planes also helps in retention and rest since it is providing support that is preventing the tissue or movement of the processes it is going to maintain the elements written to arm in its position so indirectly it is helping in retention and even the minor connector being rigid maintains the function of clasp and indirect retainer as the name suggests it is going to indirectly help in retention and also encirclement so only when there is proper encirclement there is going that is going to prevent the abutment from moving away from the clasp assembly if there is no encirclement no retention so all these five factors helps in retention next support support it is resistance towards tissue word movement so mainly it is provided by the rest it can be an occlusal rest cingulum rest or an incisal rest and also any components which is placed occlusal to height of contour also provides support now stability, it is resistance to horizontal movement of the prosthesis and this stability is provided by all the components except retentive terminal. Retentive terminal is a portion of the retentive arm which is going to engage the undercut. Since it is engaging the undercut, we have made it flexible and this flexible component will not provide stability. So a cast circumferential class provides the greatest stability whereas the rod class and the terminus since it is flexible there won't be any stability even the bar class since there is no rigid shoulder the stability is minimal compared to a cast circumferential clasp next is reciprocation as I already told a reciprocal arm is present in the clasp assembly that is going to help in stability of the tooth by counteracting the forces which is created by the return to arm as it passes over the height of contour then encirclement encirclement is a uh, characteristic of clasp assembly which is going to prevent the movement of tooth away from the clasp assembly. So the ideal requirement is 180 degree and in a circumferential clasp we have continuous encirclement that is 180 degree continuous encirclement will be there in a cast circumferential clasp. Whereas in a bar clasp we don't have a continuous encirclement rather we have a discontinuous encirclement like three point of contact will be present one by the wrist, one by the return to arm and the other one by the proximal plate. So these three factors will go and give a discontinuous 180 degree encirclement. The final factor is passivity. So as I already told, only during insertion the retentive terminus should be active. After passing the height of contour, once it has reached the undercut area, it should never be active. It should always be passive because if it is active, then it is going to continuously generate forces which is going to damage the periodontium. To avoid this, on complete seating the processes have to be passive. Next. So now coming to a circumferential clasp. So now we saw about the requirements of clasp assembly and history of clasp assembly. So there are two types of clasps. A circumferential clasp is there and a bar clasp is there. So first let us see about a circumferential clasp. It was introduced by Dr. N. B. Nesbitt in the year 1916 and it is a design of choice for a tooth supported RPD. And it is simple, easy to construct. It has excellent support, bracing and retentive properties. So coming to disadvantages, so this is the example of a circumferential clasp. Since it covers more tooth structure, it will result in decalcification or caries and it alters the normal buccolingual contours of the tooth since it is covering and also it increases the width of the foot table and not possible to adjust with pliers because it is made with a cast alloy. So now rule for fabricating this circumferential clasp, it should always origin from from the framework which lies above the height of contour. As I already told, the entire class assembly is above the height of contour except the retentive terminus. So its origin also should be above the height of contour. The retentive arm should extend cervically and circumferentially in an arc shaped fa fashion. And the reciprocal arm, it should be rigid and placed above the height of contour. And the terminus should always end in the mesial or distal line angle, not in the mid facial or mid distal. Contraindicated for mesofacial undercut in a distal extension 
extension cases, dystrophacial undercut in an anterior extension cases. And the reason we'll see in the later slide. So coming to each clasp in detail, the first being simple circlet clasp. So indication for this clasp is a tooth supported arthropedy and it is contraindicated for a distal extension cases. And coming to its design, its origin is from the proximal aspect of the teeth adjacent to the edentulous area and then the terminus engages the undercut away from the edentulous area. So what is the advantage? It is easy to construct and repair. The decision whenever there is a confusion between a simple circlet clasp and other clasp, this has to be chosen because it is easy to construct and repair. And it provides better support, stability, reciprocation, encirclement and passivity. So the disadvantage is adjustment is difficult. As I told, it is a cast alloy. So since it is a cast alloy, it is going to be difficult to adjust and also there is much tooth coverage in this class. Coming to the next class, which is a reverse circlet class. So it is here the indication is going to be distal extension case. So now we will see why we should always engage the undercut close to the edentulous area. So first always keep in mind, in a distal extension cases, the undercut close to the edentulous area has to be engaged. Never engage the undercut away from the edentulous area. And this is the reason why simple circlet clasp are contraindicated for distal extension cases. Because if you give a simple circlet clasp in a distal extension case, it is going to engage the undercut away from the edentulous area. That is a mesiobuccal undercut it is going to engage, which we doesn't want. We want to engage the undercut which is close to the edentulous area. That is a distobuccal undercut has to be engaged every time whenever we are fabricating an RPD in a distal extension case. And why we need to engage the distobuccal area undercut? On functional loading, when there is an occlusal load, there is going to be movement of the prosthesis. So the movement of the prosthesis take uh, occurs along a line called as fulcrum line which passes over the terminal rest on both the sides of the arch. So now and this terminal rest will be placed in the last tooth. So now this is the fulcrum. Anything anterior to it, it is going to lift and anything posterior to it is going to go down due to resiliency of the tissue. So it is going to be like a seesaw during an occlusal loading. So now if we fabricate a clasp in such a way that it is engaging a mesiobuccal undercut. What will happen? That is going to go up. So when it is going up, that is going to contact the height of contour and that is going to generate lateral forces to the tooth every time there is an occlusal load. That will result in damage of periodontium which we don't want. So what we are going to do? We are going to engage this distobuccal undercut. So when we are engaging this distobuccal undercut, this portion is also going to go down during an occlusal loading which Whichever is posterior to the rest is going to go down. Anterior to it will go up like a seesaw. So now when we are doing it, it is going to go down. So when it is going down, it is going to engage a greater undercut. So when it is engaging a greater undercut, there is going to be more space between the clasp assembly and the teeth and there won't be any forces generated. So the periodontium will be not compromised. So this is the reason we always use a distobuccal undercut for a distal extension case. So that's why simple circlet clasp or contraindicated for a distal extension cases and we use a reverse circlet clasp which is a reverse of simple circlet clasp in a distal extension cases. So coming to its disadvantages. So here when we see a reverse circlet clasp, it has a minor connector which just runs between the abutment tooth and its adjacent tooth and then comes on the facial aspect arcs and then engages the undercut close to the edentulous area. So now when we don't prepare this portion properly, there are chances for this portion to fracture. Coming to the other disadvantages, since it's crossing between two teeth, there can be a wedging action between the abutment and the adjacent teeth and it cannot be used in canine and premolar for its aesthetic purpose and there is lack of rest near the edentulous space. So because of that, there can be a food entrapment or a soft tissue damage. So now coming to multiple circlet clasps. So it has three indications. The first one, whenever an abutment with compromised periodontium is there, we can take an extra support by giving a multiple circlet clasp. Or when we want to replace an entire half of the dental arch, this can be given. Or when the undercut for both two abutments, when it is close to each other, this kind of clasp can be given. So design, it is nothing but a two simple circlet clasp. This is joined in the reciprocal element. So this is a lingual aspect. So the reciprocal elements will be joined. Whereas the retentive arm will be set free and here we can see the undercut area close to 
to abutment teeth. Next is an embrasure clasp. So embrasure clasp is a design of choice in all class 2 and class 3 cases with no modifications on the dentulous side. So again it is a two simple circlet clasp which is joined at the bodies. Both the reciprocal arm and the written to arm will be set free. Only in the bodies these two clasps are being joined and it is indicated for dentulous side in class 2 and class 3 cases with no modification. Next is a ring clasp. So usually it is indicated for an isolated molar teeth which has been tilted with the resulting in a large mesiolingual undercut. So now this ring clasp will origin from the framework, passes over the entire tooth and then goes to the lingual aspect and then it engages a mesiolingual undercut. Since it is passing over the entire tooth for additional bracing an auxiliary arm is also present and to prevent further tilting a rest is placed in the distal aspect and general rule it is not a design of choice if alternate design is possible. Coming to the next class which is a fish hook or a hairpin class so it is indicated in a distal extension case. So again it is similar to simple circlet clasps origins from the proximal aspect of the tooth adjacent to the edentulous area comes till the mid facial area and then loops back to engage the undercut close to the edentulous area. It will never engage the undercut away from the edentulous area. So that's why it is indicated for a distal extension cases and for this to fabricate we need crown with sufficient height. So coming to the final class which is a combination class. As the name indicates it's a combination of two material. Cast alloy is also used and a wrought alloy is also used. So now we know about the structure of a clasp assembly which has a rest, reciprocal arm, a retentive arm and a minor connector. So now the retentive arm alone will be made in a wrought alloy in a combination clasp whereas the other components will be made with a cast alloy in this case. So why only the retentive arm in a wrought alloy? As I told in distal extension we are not supposed to engage a mesiobuckle undercut. We are always supposed to engage a distal buckle undercut. What if there is no distobuckle undercut? Or what if the class which is indicated for distobuckle undercut is contraindicated in that particular clinical situation? So we can go for a combination class where the written to arm alone is fabricated with the help of a wrought alloy. The remaining structures is going to be with the help of a cast alloy. So what is the difference between a wrought alloy and a cast alloy? Cast alloy is rigid, wrought alloy is flexible. So why we need to be flexible? So already we know what happens when we engage the undercut away from the edentulous area. It is going to generate lateral forces to the abutment teeth during occlusal loading. So to prevent or to lessen the forces generated to the abutment teeth, we are going to use something which is flexible. So that is going to dissipate the forces and because of that the forces which are generated will be very limited to that particular teeth. At least we can prevent the pedontium from being compromised. So this is the use of combination clasp and ad uh, other advantages that because of increased flexibility we can even place the retentive terminus of the retentive arm in a greater undercut and also there is going to be linear tooth contact. And disadvantage since it is having two materials there is extra steps for fabrication no bracing or stabilization quality because of increased flexibility and it might prone to break or damage when the patient mishandles it. So next, as I already told, there are two types of clasp. One is circumferential clasp, other one is bar clasp. Circumferential or a supra-bulge clasp which is going to engage the undercut from the occlusal direction. Then the bar clasp or an infra-bulge clasp which is going to engage the undercut from the apical direction. So now we will see about the bar clasp. So it bar clasp it was introduced in the early 1900 but received attention in 1930 by Dr. F. Evan Groch. So it approaches the undercut from the apical or a gingival direction. So again the rules for fabricating the bar clasp is that the approach arm should not impinge on the soft tissue. As I already told this approach arm is going to arise from the rigid framework. It crosses the mucosa in horizontal direction crosses the free gingival margin in 90 degree. So when it is crossing the soft tissue, it should not impinge. It should not have relief also. The tissue surface must be smooth and it should be well polished. And when it is crossing the free gingival, it should be perpendicular and it should never be designed under the soft tissue undercut and there should be uniform taper as you already told minor connector only minor connector which is flexible is this approach arm. Next is a terminus. It is positioned as apical as possible for aesthetic reason and there is going to be a minor connector which is connecting the rest to the framework and it should be rigid and stabilize the processes. So coming for indications. So the first and foremost indication for this bar clasp is the distal extension cases. So in distal extension 
infection cases since we are supposed to engage the undercut close to the edentulous area bark class is the first indication for distal extension cases and when there is small degree of undercut in the cervical third then we can go for bark class and if the buccal sulcus is more than 4 millimeter then bark class can be given and tooth supported cases in the anterior region also bark class can be given for aesthetic purpose contraindication whenever there is a shallow vestibule severe tooth or tissue undercut and when there is excessive buccal or lingual inclination of the teeth these bar class cannot be used so advantage there's going to be better retention because of increased length of the retentive arm and better aesthetics because of gingival approach disadvantage greater tendency to collect uh, hold food debris and reduce bracing and stabilization as i already told when there is any flexible component stabilization provided by that particular clasp is going to be limited circumferential clasp has better stability when compared to bar class so there are different types of bar class t class modified t class y class and i class so all the bar class functions to engage the distobuccal undercut area. So when we engage this distobuccal undercut area on occlusal loading, there is going to be movement of processes along the fulcrum. The portion the, which is posterior to the fulcrum is going to go down due to resiliency of the tissue. And when that happens, the class terminus also goes down, engaging a greater undercut, thereby preventing the tooth from unnecessary lateral forces. So this is an example of T class which has two terminal extending from the vertical arm and modified T class only one extension will be there from the vertical arm thereby enhancing the aesthetics. So it is usually indicated for canine or premolars and Y clasp. So this is an example of Y clasp when the undercut is placed in the occlusal third. So in those cases you go for Y clasp but usually it is avoided proper recontouring of the tooth if it is done then we get go for a T clasp or a modified T clasp. And final is the I bar which is a pod shaped extension from a vertical arm. So here there is no extension, it's just a pod shaped extension which is going to engage the undercut area. So these are the difference between different bar clasps. So to conclude, according to the clinical situation, as I told, if we follow all the rules when we are fabricating the direct retainers, it is going to provide exceptional retention thereby enhancing the psychological comfort of the patient. Thank you for listening to my class.